It's not that the technology is bad, but we've allowed the technology to remove the community or to diminish the community and relationships we have. And that's caused a lot of problems. Hey guys, welcome to the show. I just want to remind you, we are on Patreon and you can help support the show through a monthly subscription. The link is down below. And today we have a special guest, Jeff Zwierink. He's an astrophysicist. He is a research scholar at Reasons to Believe, which is Hugh Ross's organization, reasonstobelieve.org. He's a writer and speaker, and he speaks on the connection between scripture's truth and scientific evidence. He's the author of several books, including Escaping the Beginning, Is There a Life Out There? And Who's Afraid of the Multiverse? Welcome, Jeff Swearing. It's good to be here today. Looking forward to our conversation. Okay, so we're, we're here today to talk about the, the metaverse. Uh, and not the multiverse, but the metaverse. And so what in the world is the metaverse? Well, the best I understand it, the metaverse is just this online digital platform that people can get into and interact. And it's uh, kind of got this notion of, you know, here we are on a, a, a digital meeting where, you know, I can see you, you can see me. But the metaverse has a, a the, the idea behind it is a much more, I'm present with what's going on. So, uh, you know, I could imagine wearing a headset where I walk into a room and I can look around and see the furniture and you walk into the room and you look around and you see the same furniture and you could imagine the, the possibilities of, you know, if we could have gloves on, we could actually, when I bump into something or where your avatar is, I would actually feel that. Or if I hit the table, my knee would feel it. So the idea is that there would be a lot of, you develop the technology that allows you to see, feel, touch, taste, hear, uh, as though we were in the same room. And so the, the metaverse is just this platform that, allows that to happen, that people want to make that happen. And kind of what's going, what it's going to look like is really going to be driven by the technology we can develop as well as the ingenuity or, you know, in some instances, the depravity of humanity, whatever we can come up with in our minds. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in, in a certain way, this is, we're kind of doing metaverse right now because we're having a virtual conversation and we're not physically together, but we, we can see each other. We could talk to each other. So in, would you say like this is sort of the beginnings of the, like Zoom, for example, is the beginnings of the metaverse? I think that's kind of an accurate way to look at it, um, except that with the metaverse, there's just a much more physical, I'm actually experiencing this. So I think of more of virtual reality rather than looking at a screen. And so some of the technology is there, but there's, you know, when, when you think of the metaverse, it's like I'm actually immersed in the experience instead of watching it on a screen. But yeah, this is obviously the preliminary steps towards doing that because without even this, we wouldn't be able to think about what do we want to see and how would that actually work? Yeah. And now are you, because you're a Christian, right? Obviously. Yes. I and, and so are you excited about the metaverse? Are you excited about where this is, you know, what this will enable us to do? Or are you sort of afraid of it? Like, where, what are your thoughts on it? I am both uh, excited and afraid, and if I'm honest, probably more afraid than excited. Uh, not so much because of the idea itself. I just think as a, my, my suspicion is as humans, we're going to use it poorly. But, uh, you know, I mean, you could ask the same question, uh, you know, 20 years ago, would you be excited about video conferencing technology? And, uh, you know, at the time I would have thought, well, that means that, you know, I'm living 1800 miles away from where our parents are, we could actually interact in a little bit more real way than just talking on the phone. Um, I could, uh, you know, have meetings that were uh, with collaborators that are scattered across the world where we can actually interact in a more personal, more tangible way, if you will. And so there's an excitement about that. Uh, the reality of it is when I look at how technology has invaded our meetings, I actually remember, uh, you know, in collaboration meetings where we would all travel somewhere. Yeah, it was a hassle to, or not so much a hassle, but an expense to get everybody there. Yeah. When everybody was there, we were all there. Uh, you know, you were talking, interacting, thinking. 
And I remember when the internet, when it was more reasonable for people to get good internet connections for their computers, people were still there, but they were answering email or uh, checking out this website. And so even though they were physically at the meeting, the presence at the meeting seemed to go, seemed to diminish. And so I think there's going to be some neat opportunities that the metaverse will add. And I think if we're not careful, it's going to diminish the relationships we have. And so I'm, I'm excited and a little anxious for it at the same time. And so what talk about kind of really kind of a specific example of how the metaverse would work. And also, is it possible now to plug into the metaverse? Right? As I, I don't even know if that's the right word, but to get into it, is it possible to do that today? So the answer to that is yes, um, in that uh, there are, you know, I mean, you, you look at a lot of online games are kind of in that fashion, you know, yeah, the, <clears throat> you're looking at a screen, but you put a set of VR glasses on and there's this kind of three-dimensional experience to it. So that sort of technology exists, uh, yeah, and it's becoming more and more realistic. And I expect that as time goes on, it will get even better and better. So yes, it's already here now. And, and some of the things that I see that would be just uh, a great opportunities or great uh, advances, uh, you know, one of the things that I see is that, you know, you've got doctors who have this uh, specialized training that can diagnose certain diseases or bone issues, or, you know, maybe perform kinds of surgery, uh, you know, that they're just, they've developed an expertise and they're really good at it. Well, one of the things they're limited now is in terms of dispersing that treatment is the number of people that can physically make it to their office. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you could, uh, you know, with relatively simple technology, you know, a few video cameras, uh, a good internet connection, uh, you know, which you can get with a cell phone in a lot of different places, you could now have that doctor supervising or performing remote surgeries kind of across the world. And so, uh, you know, you could imagine de people developing very specific expertise that instead of having to know lots of different things, they can do this one thing. And that one thing can be used to help people across the world. I, you know, that would just be really pretty cool in my book. Or, or I could envision, uh, you know, you do lots of science classes. I've been to the Grand Canyon. It's a pretty spectacular thing. But imagine instead of having to read about the Grand Canyon in a book, maybe seeing a nice documentary, uh, you could enter into the metaverse and run the run the Grand Canyon program, and you can hike down into the Grand Canyon. You can see the layers. You can reach out and touch. You maybe scrape some things and see that there are fossils in there. The the ability to use that to enhance learning uh, because you can actually see the place instead of just having to read it on or or maybe look at a picture or two or even a, a, a good high quality video. The, the idea, the things that you could learn from that are pretty, pretty spectacular. And, and again, I, I see that limited largely by just how good the technology we can develop and the creativity we can think of how could we use to educate people with these, these sorts of tools. Yeah. And isn't, isn't Facebook, which is now called Meta, isn't Facebook, uh, they already have VR, they're selling VR uh, like glasses, right? That, and you can use, and they're, they're pouring a ton of money into this, correct? Yeah, uh, Facebook slash Meta, whatever the, the preferred name is at this point in time. I think they're, I've heard somewhere that they're putting $10 billion a year for the, until it becomes a reality into this. So this is no small investment on their end. And, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I've read statements that Mark Zuckerberg wants, you know, the, the metaverse becomes a real thing when people are spending more time inside the metaverse instead of outside the metaverse. You know? so, <laughs> so this is kind of his grand plan or what he wants to see. And yeah, there are VR glasses, you know, the various companies have developed those. So a lot of that technology is there, but uh, you know, again, you remember with the VR glasses, all you get to see things, but uh, you know, if you run along and you bump into a table in the room, do you actually feel that? Well, that's going to require having some sort of suit on which has tactile sensors that can right. inject inject feelings in there how do you do smells i mean you could think about how you might do that but those are pretty pretty advanced technologies that we're just beginning to to delve into at this point and who else who else is kind of pouring money into this i think there are a lot of the big tech companies i don't have a specific list but i'm pretty okay. sure google is i think you the founder of youtube is you know there's lots of different 
organizations that are putting money into this because they kind of see it as the the future of where we're going. Uh, you know, in, in retrospect, if uh, 25, 30 years ago, I'd have invested a little bit more money in uh, internet companies, I may have been a little bit wealthier than I am now because the internet has just changed the way we operate in society today. And that's kind of the vision of what the, the metaverse will be. And uh, in, uh, right in the, in the metaverse, correct me if I'm wrong, you can buy, you can actually buy property. You can, there's all sorts of things you can do. What, what, are the, what are some of the things you can do in the metaverse besides just meeting people and like having conferences or seeing the Grand Canyon? Well, as, as I've heard, there are people who are, you know, you can basically buy areas like plots of land, you know, so that, uh, again, you know, if you think, okay, we're putting on our, our, putting on our technology, we're logging in, now you're walking around in this world. So if you could imagine selling it in a city, you could imagine selling it inside the metaverse. So there's going to be plots of land and certain plots of land are going to be more prime virtual real estate than others. And they're going to cost more money. And I've heard and of like, this is buying. actual, this is actual money. Like it's actual. Yeah. So you're buying with like blockchain, you know, probably like Bitcoin or whatever, right? You're buying the property with that currency. That's... My guess is that's probably the way it works, but I know it's actual physical money. It's not like, you know, you don't get into the metaverse and you've got your 12 meta dollars. These are actual physical dollars that you're spending to get to get uh, uh, real estate. I actually, I think I remember somebody spending, you know, some number of millions of dollars on a, on a virtual yacht inside the metaverse. And so, you no, know, so what what's exactly the, I don't understand. That? I don't quite understand that. So what, what is the purpose of buying, let's say, land in a, a let's what's the purpose of buying virtual real estate? Well, I mean, I think you ask any individual and it's going to be different. But, uh, you know, just go back to the Internet. I go out and I buy a set of numbers, uh, which is an Internet address. Now I have a domain where I can set up an online store and people can buy and sell from me. So oh, in right. the metaverse, you know, I've got a plot of land, which I can now put some graphics in and people can come in and walk into my shop, which is selling, uh, you know, who knows what surfing or, something, or yeah. online games or who knows what, what you're selling, but it's just, it's a place where people are going to, you know, again, the vision is that people are going to be in interacting, walking around, having meetings, doing social events, doing commerce, all of that sort of stuff. And there's going to be more prime real estate places that are better suited for that better, IP addresses or domains that will attract uh, more visitors, those sorts of things. So I imagine there's a business aspect of it. I'm certainly also there's there's a social status that, you know, I've got the largest plot of land in the central part of the city that really doesn't mean anything because it's all virtual. But, uh, you know, we're humans. And so the same things humans do out here, they're going to do inside the metaverse. And will there be multiple metaverses, multiverses, like, or will it just be one kind of agreed upon metaverse that all these corporations sort of agree that this is where we're going to set up shop kind of thing? That's a great question. My suspicion is that it's just going to be one because the technology, uh, to, you know, I mean, it, people are going to have to have the technology at home, but then you're also going to have to have the just the computer power and all the technology to make it happen is probably going to be cost prohibitive to have many of them out around there. Like I said, you know, uh, Meta is investing $10 billion a year. That's no small chunk of, chunk of change to uh, make this online platform work in some sort of uh, way that people want to engage with it. So my suspicion is we're just going to end up with one. But in principle, uh, you could have different companies develop different ones and you could come out of one and go into another kind of like in uh, C.S. Lewis, the, the land between or the, the space between the worlds where you can come out of one and drop back into another one. Yeah. My suspicion is we'll end up with one, though. Yeah. I mean, it's part of it. I mean, it's funny because it seems like if it really takes off and it, it seems like um, kind of an inevitability, but that there kind of won't be any need to travel ever again. <laughs> Is that, I mean, what do you think about that? I certainly hope not because uh, I actually like driving a car, but that that's kind of got its own set of issues in our world today. But um, yeah, that, that's one of the, one of the big questions I have is how will this interact with 
the way we experience things. You know, I, I could, you know, you can imagine going to the Grand Canyon and viewing that. And then, uh, you know, the next day I'm over at Yellowstone, uh, going down through Old Faithful as it's erupting because I can do that without getting hurt because it's, you know, it's virtual. It's not actually in person. And I, I wonder if there's going to be this sense where the everyday world will become too mundane because there are all of these you know, the, the types of experiences you could have in the metaverse are almost beyond what you could experience in real life. And so in some sense, it might become this drug that you can experience things that are more vivid, more lifelike, more fascinating, mm -hmm. more dopamine releasing than they are in the real world. And the real world just becomes mundane, boring and depressing uh, which is going to lead to a whole lot of other problems in society. So. Well, that's what I, I mean. I was thinking about that because it seems like we're already, you know, because of social media and because of all, you know, the smartphone and all this stuff, we're already kind of in, so isolated because we're, we no longer go out to, you know, do stuff or see friends or we actually, we were just in, in church the other day, we just did a, a, my pastor did a sermon on the importance of gathering together, as it says in Hebrews, uh, don't, you know, don't forsake the assembling together. And uh, community is so important, especially in the Christian life. So my fear is not, is that not, not only just for Christians, but for everyone, this is just going to be even more isolating and people are just going to never leave their homes and just be in this kind of virtual world all the time. And I think that, I mean, the big danger obviously with that is their mental health issues, you know, just isolation, loneliness. Uh, I think it's just going to compound that kind of stuff. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? That to me is one of the biggest fears I have of what's going, what, what we will actually use the metaverse to do. Uh, you know, I just, I, I remember watching commercials and, you know, this isn't a, uh, a statement on Facebook one way or the other, but more a statement on how we use technology as, you know, it's got these two dads who are with their daughters that they're at the baseball game. And apparently it's take your daughter to the baseball game. And so the dads are connecting on Facebook because they're taking their daughters to the, ba the baseball game. And my original, my thought was, you've got your daughter at the baseball game and you're connecting with other dads who've taken their daughters to a baseball game. Why not spend the time with your daughter? Because that's the more important relationship right there. I think yeah. that's what's going to happen in the metaverse is we're going to have these needs or drives or incentives to connect with people in a more shallow way at the expense of developing the deeper relationships that God has designed for us to have. Um, you know, yeah. so, I, you know, we talk about marriage, we talk about family. Those are the, those are the relationships that are kind of the backbone of a healthy society. And I think the metaverse ultimately, while it has the potential to enhance those relationships, we're going to use it in a way that will spread our relationships in more shallow ways over more people instead of having the deeper relationships with a few people the way we're designed. Yeah. And I mean, that's how I, you know, I feel about the smartphone. It's like this, you know, when the smartphone first came out and every, we were all excited and, you know, we could do all these things with it, but now it's just like, we're kind of glued to the phone. Mm -hmm. We're not, we're not really interacting with other people as much. And we're on social media all the time, instead of, you know, as a Christian, I always say like, if we spent as much time on social media as we did in the word of God, we just think how much growth we would have as believers. But I, in a way, you know, and I, I kind of think this about the, the metaverse is just like the, the smartphone on balance. I mean, I, I always say this on balance. I think the smartphone and social media is a net negative. And I think because it, it has isolated us so much. And, and I think it's, I mean, I, I mean, I doubt to be sound dramatic, but I, I just feel like it's Satan's master. It's one of his masterpieces is creating the smartphone or is helping, uh, you know, the folks who created uh, the smartphone. It, it's like his, one of his masterpieces. And I'm, I'm concerned that, you know, he, that this is going to be kind of similar in the metaverse where we're just, we, we no longer know how to be humans with each other. We're just, we just, we can only live in a virtual world. I mean, I can imagine that in 30 years or 50 years where, especially young people, kids who grow up in the metaverse. Mm -hmm. And th that's their only context 
of life. It's like, oh, I, the life, the real life outside, that's boring. I'm just going to live in the metaverse. I think that's a very real concern. And, and I think what's, what's helped me to think about that is to recognize that there's a difference between the technology and the way we use the technology. I, I mean, at the end of the day, a smartphone is just like a hundred dollar bill. It's, it's a, a tool, it's neither good nor bad. I can use the hundred dollar bill to go out and buy drugs. I can use it to go buy people for people or food for people who are starving. I can use it for good or bad. The people are the problem uh, because we're the ones who are the sinners. We, you know, it's, it's not the technology. But, uh, you know, so as, as we ask that question, I mean, even with the social media, uh, one thing that seems abundantly clear is that when you look at how people have designed social media, what they were wanting to do, uh, even with good intentions, they missed the way humans would use it. So, uh, you know, I, I just remember watching a, a documentary called The Social Dilemma, uh, which is looking at the people who are behind Google and Facebook and Instagram. And, uh, you know, one of the comments that one of the people made is like, yeah, we developed the like button because we wanted to spread positivity around. I mean, great, you know, well-intentioned idea that what we missed was that this now becomes a way of measuring my social status. The more likes means I'm better, the less likes means I, I don't look good or whatever. And so we just missed the human connection in that because we just kind of proceeded full speed uh, as though as though it was a good thing. And, and it missed in there as well that there were a lot of people who didn't really think about whether this was going to be good or bad. They just said, how can I make a dollar off of it? And I yeah. don't see anything about that attitude having changed as we're going into the metaverse. In fact, a lot of the people who developed our social media are the same people driving the metaverse. So I expect those same sort of problems. If, if you're investing $10 billion a year to make it happen, you're, you're betting there's going to be a monetary return coming out of that. What's the mechanism for making money? And does it prey on people or does it help people? And my suspicion is it's going to prey on people rather than help people, because as a history of our society, that tends to be what people do to one another. <laughs> yes. And that's I mean, that's funny because, you know, Facebook, when Facebook first kind of surfaced and then Instagram and all these social media platforms, it was, you know, it seemed like, wow, like. I can just join and there's no, I don't have to pay a fee. Like what, what is this? Why it's free. And you can just kind of post pictures and everyone can see them. And, you know, little do you know, once they hit kind of a critical mass, once they hit about, you know, whatever that was 10 years ago, uh, then they start doing the advertising. And so, and people buy ads for, for Instagram, Facebook, and for other things. And, and so now when you scroll through Instagram, I mean, I don't know if this is true for everyone, but I, when I scroll through Instagram, I think like every, almost every other image is an ad or every, every other, every few images is an mm -hmm. ad. Right. And just the amount of just like I, that is for, I mean, as a, as you know, as adults, we can kind of filter that and, and figure that out. But, but for, I just feel like for young people, people in junior high or high school who are dealing with this, it's just like how damaging, not the ads necessarily, but how damaging is it, as you said, like with the, the likes and, you know, the likes make me feel good. And, and what if I don't get the likes, that's going to make me feel depressed. And, and it's like, these poor, I feel so bad for these poor kids growing up in this world where their, their whole kind of self-esteem, which I don't even, that that's not even a biblical term, but their whole kind of world is built on, you know, how many people like me, how many people follow me. And it just, it seems so damaging to young people. I agree. And, uh, you know, that one of the big differences, you know, I, I'm, a little older than the younger generation at this point. And so when I have my phone, I've really worked diligently to keep the mindset that this is a tool. Is this tool helping me engage what's important or not? But I look at my kids and especially the kids that are around and the phone is an extension of their being, not a tool that they tend to, yeah, yeah, there's just a real different mindset about it. And, uh, you know, I, I just stepped back and I remember back when cell phones came out and they, these were kind of these novelties 
that people occasionally would use them to call their call somebody when they got in trouble. More times than not, they called it to order pizza so they didn't have to wait in line. <laughs> but it was really kind of this expensive novelty until somebody came along and figured out how to market them. And if I mean, I remember this in retrospect. I didn't see it so much at the time, but they began to say, well, here, we'll give you a phone, sign up for the plan and we'll allow you to upgrade. And there for about five years, you could just see, I mean, in retrospect, I look back and all of the companies were just eating the cost of the technology. Because they knew, they, knew the they had you on the hook for the rest of your life. <laughs> exactly. And why is it that we didn't catch that? Uh, you know, you know, because, you know, Facebook, all these things are given away for free. I'm pretty sure the metaverse, when you first start using it, it's not going to cost you to get into it because you, you, they want you to get in there and use it and see what it can do, whether good or bad. But once you're in and can hook, then now we're going to start figuring out how to make money off of it. And again, you know, I, I, it could be done in a, in a healthy, positive way. My suspicion is it won't be just given our history. Yeah. And the, the indwelling sin of, of humans, uh, man's sinful nature, sin nature. Um, yeah. And I mean, I, I mean, I miss the day I, I, I miss cause like I grew up in the eighties and nineties and you know, that was kind of when I was young and came of age and, and I just miss those times where it was, I mean, when I, I moved to LA in 1993 and I, it's like when you wanted to hang out with somebody you had to go make an effort and go meet up with them and hang out and, and meet friends and go to places. And, and, uh, and I just, yeah, I just, I miss those times and I miss the days of, you know, there was, a, you had a landline and an answering machine and that was it. And, and when you left the house for the day, no one could get it. No one could reach you unless you had a pager or something, but no one could reach you. And so you sort of had this, um, you weren't so attached all the time to the constant noise because also one of the things I find about this technology is that it, it creates more and more noise because for example, back in the day when there were just landlines, people, if they wanted to call you, it was, it was like a real effort and it was a, um, you know, it wasn't just like texting somebody <clears throat> nonstop. And so now we're in this, we're in this situation where we have all these ways to communicate. <laughs> we can DM on Instagram. We can, you know, messenger on Facebook. We can, we can text, we can WhatsApp, mm -hmm. like all these things. And it seems like, oh, that's a great idea, but it actually creates more, uh, more kind of not chaos, but just more just stuff all the time in your mind and you're, you're, it's, it's a constant distraction. And again, my fear as a Christian is it's distracting us from our time with the Lord, our time with other believers, our, our time, uh, in community. And so I just really miss those days. I miss those days of, of that kind of, once you left your house, you there was no noise in your head. You were just kind of doing your thing, meeting up with people. But this seems like, and with especially with the metaverse, it seems like we're never <laughs> going to be able to escape. Well, I agree very much with what you're saying, and you know what what it struck me about all of this is, uh, you know, it, just in the in the debates and arguments I've seen about it, there's. The, the question almost always is, is the metaverse a good thing? Is the smartphone a good thing? And I think that misses that at the end of the day, those are just tools. You know, I can ask, is $100 million a good thing? Right. Maybe, maybe it's just money, if you will. Uh, you know, the Bible doesn't say money is the root of all deal, evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. And so the what I, what I have found, which... Uh, you know, I'm very sympathetic to, you know, the liking the old days, because what I found is that the structure of society did things to support growing up, being healthy, mature, having good relationships. And we're just at a place now where society in general doesn't do that. A lot of those safeguards are off. So I can still live in a way where my mind is uncluttered. There's not a lot of noise coming in there, but I have to be much more mature and disciplined about it. And so yeah. I think that's a, it, it, it has forced me to think, okay, what is important? 
What do I want to do? And I think as Christians, we're well positioned to have a place where we can go out and share what Christianity, why, why, what Christianity is. And people are going to increasingly be interested because what they will see is the shallowness and the brokenness and the depression of what the world has to offer. Uh, the hard part about that is, is that people are going to experience a lot of pain, but Christianity has a great message of hope, which is what a lot of people are looking for in the technology. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, if we are, if as Christians, we prepare and we think, hey, what is important? How has God designed us? And how can we articulate that? Well, we can have a very powerful bo voice because the tech if you go back a few years, most people, you could argue, just weren't interested in Christianity because life was pretty good, didn't need a lot. Well, I think you're going to see a lot more brokenness. And that's a place where Christianity, again, just has a great message of hope. So I'm excited about what it will bring, as well as not really wanting to live through some of the consequences that will provide those opportunities. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And uh, in terms of uh, you know, in terms of Christianity and, and evangelism and the gospel, I mean, this a lot of this technology has been amazing because we can. I, I know a, a, of churches who uh, and organizations who are able to, you know, put the gospel on a, you know, some sort of electronic device, and they drop like millions of these devices into into unreached uh, people groups and into unreached people in their countries or their locations. And I think that's had a profound effect on evangelism. Mm -hmm. so, exactly. I mean, you know, the, the same technology uh, or you know, that, that the technology that we're decrying and we're wondering how it's going to play out has opened up opportunities to to take the gospel in place. I mean, you know, just even over 100 years ago, I've been able to go over to Europe and other countries and share the gospel simply because for a relatively small amount of money, I can hop on a plane and be over there later today. Um, you know, the technology opens up these opportunities but I just have personally found in my life, uh, I used to think I was very disciplined. And I realized a lot of that discipline was the fact that I just didn't have a lot of money. And so there weren't a lot of vices <laughs> open to me. The more I have, the more my wealth has increased, the more I realized it wasn't so much that I was disciplined. I just didn't have the opportunity. The access, so yeah. As I have more money, I have had to mature so that I don't use that money to engage the vices and to do what I had said was important all along. And so, uh, you know, it, it provides a, an impetus for me to grow stronger and to mature and to know Christ in a deeper and deeper way. Uh, it just, it makes it a little bit more of a, not a solitary journey, because it's a journey in community. There just seems to be less people who are interested in engaging on that journey. And so yeah. it, what I miss is that society used to orient people that way. And that is increasingly diminishing, correlating with when our technology is developing more recently. Yeah. And, and what are what are NFTs? I mean, I know what they are, but explain to my audience, what are NFTs? Because they're they they will be available in the metaverse to purchase and and you know non-fungible tokens, right? Okay. Uh, do you know so, do you know what I'm talking about? I've heard the term. I, you know, it's you know, one, of the, one of the things you're dealing with when you're inside the metaverse is one, how do you exchange um, money? You know, that's part of the uh, interest in cryptocurrency is a way of providing currency that is uh, not necessarily trackable to an individual. You can track its transactions, but it's not tied to a person. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's great if you want to launder money, uh, but I, yeah, increasingly... You know, we saw with Ukraine, PayPal has shut or there are various countries have shut down the ability to electronically transfer funds, you know, so mm -hmm. so there are as as governments are going to get more oppressive, I think some of these technologies will allow the oppressed groups to still be able to operate in a way and, uh, you know, there, there's a very real sense where if you if the, the end times or as things are coming to a close, it's it's going to be a tough time for Christians. And so having some of these technologies around are going to be a great blessing. Uh, I, I'm not entirely sure if that's what the well, NFTs are. Well, NFTs are, like NFTs are, um, they're actually, you know, they're basically electronic. Uh, I don't even know how to describe them, but they're, it's almost like a me. So for example, if I created this electronic meme mm -hmm. and it went viral, 
then I can actually sell that. People are actually selling the original kind of like the original meme for hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's like kind of like selling art now. And so non they're called non-fungible tokens, which, you know, means you can't replicate them. Mm. And, um, and so that apparently in the metaverse, that's one of the, that's one of the things you can do in the metaverse is buy NFTs and, you know, and, and these are actually in the real world, they're actually valuable things and you can Mm -hmm. sell them. I I know people who have, I mean, just there's like one, I can't remember. There's like one NFT. It's like a cat. It's like a, it's like an animated cat chasing something. I forgot what it is, but that sold for like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that's a real thing. And so I think people in the metaverse are going to be kind of doing investing in non-fungible tokens. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, we, I see that play out in the physical real world. Uh, you know, I largely, I, I have yet to ever buy a pair of shoes for anything other than I need something to wear on my feet. But I know people who will spend hundreds and thousands of dollars to get this pair of shoes to mount on the wall. Um, we will collect, I mean, that's what the Beanie Baby craze was back in the 90s. It's oh, like, right, you know, right, yeah. It's toys that people, adults decided were valuable. And, you know, it, it, it just, this sounds like taking that somebody's found a way to create value or, or, or imbue value or convince people it's valuable. And so now in that case, you've got a way to sell things. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what most good business models are built on is find a product that people have value and find a way to distribute to them where what they will pay is less than what it costs, takes you to generate, uh, whether NFTs are a good thing or a bad thing in that business model, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but it that, that seems to me a logical progression of what I've seen throughout throughout the history of humanity. Uh, you know, I like collecting certain things. I just don't like spending a lot of money doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and then obviously, also in the metaverse, you we will have. You know, well, I don't even know if I'm going to ever join. I don't know. I doubt I'll be a part of it. I mean, maybe it'll be. You can't even live without it at a certain point. But just like our smartphones. But, um, and we'll have avatars of ourselves, right? That we will create. Mm -hmm. And what will that, what will that entail? What will that be like? Just kind of constructing like what you look like or doing a photo and that becoming your avatar. Well, that's the sort of thing that happens now just in games. I mean, I like Mario Kart, uh, you know, whether you're on the Wii or the, the Nintendo switch or whatever, when you, when you get those games, you can go in and create a me and you can change the hair or you can pick hair color and facial expression and clothes. And so that's, that is a, a a primitive representation or primitive avatar. That's the sort of thing that you will have out in the metaverse. And, you know, when my family does it, we largely create things that try and look like us because we're trying to accurately portray how we look, but you can see that people could go in and make you know, you could be a cat, you could be a dog, you could be the, the the top hat from Monopoly. You could make any sort of reality you want. And I think that's going to be one of the problems we'll experience uh, or that we will see is that in the metaverse, it gives people an excuse to project an image different from who they are. Uh, you know, sometimes that's a that's a useful thing, but oftentimes that's an escape because I'm not adequate, people won't like me, whatever you now begin living this alternative reality. And that's just an unhealthy way to do things, uh, at least as a regular way of living. And so I think that's gonna be a a problem in the metaverse, uh, as well as another problem that arises. I think there's a fair number of people who will not be able to engage in the metaverse simply because they can't use VR technology without getting sick. Uh, Right, oh yeah, yeah. You know, there's uh, studies I've seen that upwards of uh, one in four people by using VR technology for a few minutes actually start getting physically ill. And so, you know, are you going to have the haves and the have nots, the people who can engage in the majority of commerce and the people who just can't get in because they get sick? Or, you know, is there a technological solution to that? I, you know, these are the issues that where we have haves and have nots and people can be other than who they are, that's never worked out well in, in society. Yeah, I, I remember uh, the New York Times. This was, I don't know how long ago, five, seven, eight years ago, they sent out to all the subscribers uh, kind of this cardboard uh, VR thing. 
you yeah. know, and, and I remember, I, I think I still have it actually, but yeah, I felt the same. I felt like dizzy after using it. And I was like, oh, I can't this because and I just put it on. It was just like a very basic, simple uh, thing. But I, I put it on and I was like, whoa, like I can't. This is too. I, I need Dramamine. So maybe the I think Dramamine stock is going to go way up <laughs> in the metaverse. <laughs> so it might be good to be, to to uh, to invest in that. Um, and so when the big question is, when do you think we will be? just like we are now with the smartphone where it's like everyone's on board, everyone has one, everyone's a part of it. Everyone's on social media, essentially. I, I actually am envious of, of those who are not on social media at all and have never been. I have friends who've never, young friends who've never ever joined social media in any way. And I'm like, that, is so, that was so wise of you. Yeah. Um, but when do you think this will, fully be a real uh, quote unquote no no pun intended a reality you know I, I i have learned that i'm not a very good prognosticator of things like that but but what i see is that there is an air of inevitability about it uh you know even if i could convince 90 percent of the people in the united states or even western world that it's a bad idea there's still that 10 percent out there who think yeah this is a great thing and uh if you you can drive towards it, make it work. And there's an attractiveness to it. I mean, I would love, there are certain movies. Could you imagine watching Star Wars in 3D VR glasses and being a part of, I mean, that would just be so cool. I would love that. <laughs> I, I have this suspicion that I would end up with a headache and feel sick afterwards, yeah. just uh, given some ex the difference between Universal Studios and an actual roller coaster uh, that I have. But uh, yeah, there's gonna, there's just kind of an attractiveness, coolness factor about it. The question in my mind is what sort of thing will come along that will drive it beyond the cool kind of niche technology that people play around with, uh, like cell phones used to be, to where it drives it beyond that into, oh, this is what everybody uses day in and day out. Mm. I don't know what will do that. It may be that it'll just be a fairly seamless transition because everybody's on their smartphones already. It could be that People get in and start, well, you know, I, I can play with it, but my, my spouse can't or my kid can't or whatever. And so we're just, it's going to be this thing that I play around with every now and again, or it could be some other combination. I just don't know what the, the marketing and the technology will develop to allow that. What I can say unequivocally is that people are all in on making this happen and I don't get to sit back and say, well, I hope it isn't going to work. My suspicion is somewhere in there it's going to work. And my challenge to myself and others is like, what can we do to make sure that when this happens, we use it well to enhance and to, for the enhancement of society and for the betterment of people without and, and mitigate the damage that we know is going to be part of that as much as we might try and just bury our head in the sand and say it won't happen. Yeah. Yeah, that's the that's the risk and the danger. Uh, I, I personally, you know, as I've said, I just it 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 seems like it's gonna be it's, it seems like a bad idea, but I can see the benefits of it. Um, and so, where can not only, number one, where can people reach you? But number two, what wh what are you working on now? So uh, one of the, the more recent endeavors I've had was just kind of delving into artificial intelligence. And this is a, I, I put artificial intelligence in the metaverse kind of in a similar class is that these are very powerful technologies, uh, but at the end of the day, they're just tools. And the question is going to be, how are we as humans going to use them? And um, one of the things that I have tried to do is, you know, as we, you know, when I think AI, I'm typically thinking R2D2, C3PO, you know, these sentient silicon-based life forms that interact. You, you can tell their, their thinking and conscious uh, whether they have the technologies we do. They have certain better facilities, sometimes worse. But uh, the reality is, is there's a different kind of AI, which is just ubiquitous in society. So when you're talking on your smartphone to Siri to get directions, that's an AI. Even your, your mm. maps are an AI that are, they're doing certain tasks. And what, we, what I found is that as we get, or as we program these machines and give them the learning, quote unquote, learning skills 
to master technology, they tend to do it much better than us. Uh, you know, when you go play chess programs right now, they're powered by AIs that will beat you every single time. I mean, there is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And so they, they throttle them down so that we can still play with them, but their chess playing ability far outseeds all human abilities. And so my question is, as we were developing these AIs, how can we, you know, how, how as a Christian do I think about this? And, and I realize they're powerful tools and they're so powerful that we need to make sure we're going to use them well. And, and the question in my mind is what worldview allows us to build these AIs and value, build value for humanity while mitigating the harm that will come? And I, make a, I think you can make a strong case that the Christian worldview is the one you want to adopt, because if not, we're going to use AIs to make it so that people don't work or can't work. We're going to uh, use it. It will advance crime. I mean, you know, it will do things that will be detrimental to society unless we have the right worldview. And so I think, you know, the metaverse, again, is one of those technologies. I think the Christian worldview provides us the resources to use the metaverse to enhance humanity and, and, and mitigate the consequences against it. So those are those are two of the big projects that I've been working on lately. Nice. Yeah, I mean, speaking of that, the the, the crime aspect, it's just like my, this is, so, this is so just kind of, you know, what we're dealing with now with this technology is, you know, like, a, I think it was a month ago or two months ago, my um, Instagram got hacked mm -hmm. into by someone in Nigeria. And, uh, and it was so rattling to me because they were pretending they were me and sending all of my friends or my, you know, people who follow me on, on Instagram, all these kind of crazy sales things like, oh, you guys, you have to buy this Bitcoin today, like blah, 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 you know, you're gonna. So it was so rattling to me because I was just like, and I couldn't get it back. I couldn't mm -hmm. get my account back. And then I finally was able to get it back after, I think it was like 24 hours. I contacted Facebook and all, you know, did all this stuff. I had to take all these pictures of myself holding mm -hmm. up signs that it was me with the code on it. And, um, and so I, I got it back and then like seconds later, they broke into it again. They hacked oh, no. it again. And I was like, ah, and so it was stressing me out so much because I knew that they were targeting people who followed me and, and with mm -hmm. just lies basically and pretending to be me. And so it felt, it felt like such a crazy violation and it was it was just very unnerving. I was able to finally get it back again, and I was able to block them forever through just different ways. But um, so now it's fine. <laughs> but but that's the that's the downside of this technology. It's just scary because there's so much so much crime that could happen inside the technology. Oh, a absolutely. Uh, you know, we were we started off the program talking about, you know, how do a doctor could use their expertise to provide healing around the world. That same technology gives access to the con man, more people, you know, people across the globe. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to, you know, just because things were earlier doesn't mean they were better. But I do remember um, when I was growing up, I knew everybody in our neighborhood, the, the way you dealt with people was community-based rather than technology-based. So when mm -hmm. you, you you could protect your neighborhood by knowing who was there, and when people came in and saying weird things, you just kind of knew that. It didn't fit with the, the community. Well, now, you know, there's not, there are not enough, there are so few people that have the technological wherewithal to keep themselves from being hacked that we have to transfer the the ability to deal with all of that into the technological realm so now you no longer have humans that are supervising what's going on the technology is taking care of it and so there are all just these weird issues where like i said it's not that the technology is bad but we've allowed the technology to remove the community or to diminish the community and relationships we have and that's caused a lot of problems. And we now deal with things like somebody can hack into your account and, and it won't be too long before someone can take a video clip of you, go behind and figure out how to emulate your voice or they could even auto tune it and make a video of you saying things that you never said that are antithetical to who you are. <laughs> 
<laughs> and people will not be able to tell the difference. That sort of technology wow. is just around the corner. It's already in its infancy, or it's it's not even in its infancy. It's been developed. It's just not quite there yet. But those yeah. sorts of things are going to be had. So if, and if Photoshop that's, wreaked havoc, imagine what that's going to do. Uh, that's scary. Well, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll just keep praying that Jesus returns before all this happens. So... <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Well, that, that one thing that is provides me great comfort is that nothing that we're doing is outside God's control. And so yes. there have been masterful world takeover plots and things that are going to destroy society throughout history. And none of those have succeeded beyond what God has intended. So exactly. I, the metaverse I know. is not outside God's control. <laughs> He's sovereign. And that I take great comfort in that. So uh, thank you, Jeff. Now tell us where we can reach you. So the, the best way to connect up is to go to reasons.org. That's the website of Reasons to Believe, the organization I work for. Uh, I have a, Okay, it's reasons.org, not reasons to believe.org. Yes, it's reasons.org. And uh, yeah, there's uh, Facebook, there's uh, your social media platforms, RTB underscore official. Uh, mine is RTB underscore Jay's Waring. Uh, those, are, those are the easiest ways to connect up and get a hold of me. All right, great. Well, thank you for helping us understand the metaverse. And uh, it's it's been a pleasure. And I I, uh, I hope this doesn't really come to full fruition in my lifetime, but we'll see. But thank you for being on the show. Well, thanks. It's been a joy talking and having the conversation today.